take you to Zavgorodny, which is the <coughs> prior art relied on in the case. Yep. That uh, is in the supplementary body of Tab 5. Very short paper. I'll maybe do it from the judgment just so you've all seen it. You'll see um, it's, uh, one alkyl thioalkylation nucleoside hydroxyl functions and its synthetic application. A new versatile method in nucleoside chemistry. Um, and you'll see in the second paragraph of the text explains one alkyl thioalkyl group proposed as potential protecting groups of the sugar hydroxyl functions of nucleosides. Uh, and, and it explains how they're introduced and explains there's a shortcoming in the method for making them. Um, and then they say, we now report on preparation uh, by a modified rearrangement. Uh, and it explains that you get the, uh, the corresponding uh, three methyl, thio methyl nucleosides in good yield, just uh, about halfway down between the whole punch, bottom hole punch and bottom page. Mm. And if your lordships turn over, you'll see the scheme is laid out, and uh, the molecule at the end uh, on the second row, numbered 5, um, if that uh, has the X as defined as the N3, which is in the list of possible constituents of the X group, that gives you the azido-methyl. And then in the last paragraph of the paper, um, uh, it explains the compounds discussed above are useful, specifically block synthons, and it gives some examples. And then the last sentence it says, azido-methyl group is of special interest since it can be removed under very specific and mild conditions, viz. with triphenylphosphine and atrispyrene at 20 degrees C. Um, so that's, that's the prior art document. The judge dealt with it um, at 184 uh, Paragraph 184 in the judgment onwards. Uh, we don't dispute his description of what it discloses. Uh, so 184 uh, through to uh, 192, uh, he uh, cross references the azido metal portions. And then in 193, he starts a comparison uh, of between Zabgorodny and the patent. Uh, and uh, in 195, he explains uh, his understanding of the basis for the expert evidence. And he says, Professor Marx, that's our expert, um, approached it on the basis that the skilled person would look at Zabgorodny with the specific aim in mind of finding a blocking group that might they might be able to use in a reversible chain terminated sequencing process. And the cross-examination of Professor Ledley was on the same premise. However, I rejected this premise. Um, it's tempting, therefore, simply to stop at this point and find the claim is not obvious. Now, um, we do take issue with his characterization of the cross-examination of Professor Ledley, and I'll show you um, a, a very short extract uh, in a moment, if I may, to show why the judge was wrong about that. Uh, why don't, I, why don't I do that uh, now? It's in the uh, cross examination, is in supplementary bundle. And it's uh, tab 16. And it's uh, page 312 of the cross. way it was put to Professor Ledley, which is page 292 of the bundle, um, and the way it was put to Professor Ledley is set out at, paragraph, at line 13 on 312, put it to him, I want to assume that the skilled person reading Zavgorodny knows about the method of sequencing by synthesis using reversible chain terminators. Yes, making all those assumptions, and we get read Zavgorodny with interest. Okay, yes. So, um, in my respectful submission, I didn't put it as high as the judge characterised it to um, Professor Ledley. That was uh, the outset of the cross-examination on Zadgorodny. It proceeded on that basis. But in fact, the way I put it was precisely as the judge has found the common general knowledge to be that the 
skilled person knew about sequencing by synthesis using reversible chain terminators, but it was not suggested that the skilled person was looking for a new blocking group, um, as the judge criticised Professor Marx's evidence, um, and therefore we say that the judge was wrong at the outset in his uh, understanding of Professor Ledley's evidence. Well, what about 314? as um, you put it to the witness there, this paper would therefore be of interest to anyone looking to make a protecting group for a sugar hydroxyl function. Yes, and that's because of the, that passage I showed you in Zabgarovny where um, uh, they uh, say in the second paragraph um, that these groups have also been proposed as potential protecting groups of the sugar hydroxyl function of nucleosides. So I, I was cross-referring back to paragraph two of Zabgarodny. Um, and uh, 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 in my submission, that was a, a fair question to ask, and the witness answered it also fairly and correctly, based on um, the disclosure of Zabgarodny and, and the common general knowledge. So my lord, um, that, that, that's the submission on that. Um, the judge goes on uh, in 198, uh, in relation to Zafirodny, and he reiterates the identity of the skilled team. Um, he says they're working on research into sequencing by synthesis. They're aware of the idea of using RCTs, but as far as they were concerned, the idea had not succeeded. They knew that to make it work, they would need to come up with a system in which one could repeatedly incorporate a nucleotide linked to a specific label, one at a time, in a reversible way, uh, they didn't have any specific problem or problems in mind which had to be solved as a key to unlock the ability to take the method forward. It may well have been that the technique simply could not be made to work. Now, um, we contrast his uh, characterization of the common general knowledge here with the approach, again, he took on priority. Because what he says here, um, what they were looking for was a system in which one could repeatedly incorporate a nucleotide linked to a specific label one at a time in a reversible way. Uh, and that disclosure of repeated incorporation of a nucleotide linked to a label one at a time in a reversible way is not disclosed by, uh, not disclosed plausibly by the priority document. In fact, there's no disclosure in even in example one of the priority document of the use of a label. And we say that's something that the judge, again, he was inconsistent in his approach as between inventive step and priority. And, and if he'd he was right about inventive step in 198, he should not have found uh, that the priority was plausibly and, and enabled, in, claimed in an enabling way um, because of the absence of disclosure of precisely what he points out in 198 in the priority document. Um, so that's 198. 199, um, uh, he refers to uh, the fact that Zabgarodny does call out the mild and specific conditions for use of the azido methyl group. Um, uh, and he uh, says that um, that would be, have nothing to do with the fo their focus on sequencing by synthesis. He says it would only be seen as uh, something in the skilled uh, person's general toolbox, and they'd read it with interest and then put it down and move on. Uh, and in our submission, that again is inconsistent with the evidence that Professor Ledley gave, and which he gave put on the right premise, that is to say that the skilled person was interested um, uh, or knows about the method of sequencing by synthesis using reversible chain terminators and reads Zabgarovny with interest. So if I may, I'm just going to show your lordships um, uh, three or four passages of the cross-examination, just ask your lordships to read it to show why we say that um, uh, the judge's summary of the skilled person's approach uh, based on Edgar Rodney is incorrect. Um, I was going to show you the passage on 314. Your Lordship's already referred me to that. So we're back in tab 16, uh, page 292. <coughs> and uh, the next passage is on page 315 of the transcript. And I said to Professor Ledley at line 6, um, but azido-methyl is picked out as being of special interest. He agrees, yes, 
I mean, in my report, I wanted to fairly and squarely agree that this discloses the Zedo methyl. Of course, the skilled person, if they were to find this paper and came with an interest and knowledge of reversible chain terminators, they would read it not just with an eye to a Zedo methyl, but they would notice that, as it says in the final paragraph, there are a number of other products that, which are known, established, well characterized hydroxyl blocking groups. So, just pausing there, Professor Ledley's approach was not that you'd put the paper down and go away, is that you would notice not only Azido methyl accepted, but that there were a number of other well characterized groups there. Um, uh, and his point is at the end of this passage at line <coughs> 17, he says, So the skilled person coming without the patent in mind would be likely to be as impressed by those alternative products of Zafgrodny 1991 as by Azido methyl. And I say to him, But Azido methyl is of special interest since it is said to have mild and specific deprotection conditions. And he says, yes, and I interpret mild in the chemical sense, meaning specific and selective. So his evidence was not that the skilled person uh, would put uh, Zagorodny down and go on and do something else instead. Is that all premised on the, at line nine, where he says, if they came with an interest in reversible chain terminators? Um, so line nine and of, of page 315. 315. A skilled person, if they were to find this paper and came with an interest and a knowledge of reversible chain terminators, and you've asked him to assume that they know about SBS using reversible chain terminators. Yes. But he's there introducing another condition, isn't he? That they're actually interested in reversible chain terminators. Uh, yes, I suppose it could, that could be understood in that way. I, I think the criticism the judge made of Professor Marx's evidence was that it was put on the basis that the skilled person was looking for a new terminator. And, and his, his finding on the common general knowledge was that that wasn't the case, because people didn't think there were so many problems with this technique, yeah. people didn't think the identification of the terminator was the problem. But isn't that what, what this Professor Ledley is saying here? Well, if you're interested in those, there's, there's a whole lot to look at. But he's not saying you would look at all those. No, we're, well, I don't. Yes, yes. I, I understand your lordship's point. I, he's not saying that you're interested in looking to find a new terminator. He's just yeah. saying you've got an interest in, in terminators, which you, if you were working on the sequencing by synthesis, as the judge found you would be as the skilled person, then you are bound to have an interest in, in the technique in general and things that could be used in the technique, even if, as the judge found, you didn't, uh, you hadn't necessarily identified that the uh, identi that the Terminator itself was the problem. Yes. So, um, so uh, it's interest in the concept. Interest in the concept, yes. And it, uh, so, the, in my own defence, it certainly wasn't put to Professor Ledley that that's what you had to have. He, he's the one who introduced it, and I accept your lordship's um, uh, point on that. Um, so, so uh, yes, and, and in, in the passage, I've, I've, I've overlooked um, lines 12 to 17, he also points out there are a number of other products, well-established, well-established, well-characterised hydroxyl blocking groups. Um, so, so he's clearly got in mind um, that, there are, uh, that the, the method is known and that there are various groups one could use. And he identifies azido methyl as being one of the groups in Zafgorodny that uh, might be of interest. Um, on 319, uh, Again, I, I put this point about um, the, the value of Zafgorodny. So if, if you look, if you just read 319 line 2 to 31 line to, to line 22, please. basis that skilled person was looking for a new terminator, I put it on the basis that someone working in sequencing would recognise that a protecting group on this function would act as a terminator, and he agreed. 
uh, and, and indeed he agreed it could be used in Sanger sequencing. Um, uh, and that would be apparent to any skilled person. So again, this is not consistent with the judge's approach that the skilled person would just put this down um, uh, without further interest. Um, and then the uh, 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 final set of passages just at, um, let's see, page 297 of the bundle, page 334 of the transcript. And um, I, 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 bottom of 333, I say to the professor, just you, professor, you're told in Zabrodny how to make the azido methyl blocking group, and it would be easy to test multiple polymerases for incorporation of that blocking group. And his response was, you're told in Zabrodny how to make six or seven blocking groups, and most of the ones other than the azido methyl are more attractive on the basis of the conditions for their removal being better understood and they would be taken forward, in my view, in preference to azido methyl. And then I asked him, which ones do you say would be taken forward in preference, Professor? And he then wanted to go back to the paper, so there was an exchange with the judge um, about which ones would, would be uh, would go back to. Um, and then um, I asked him again on the following page in the bundle, at 336 of the transcript, um, after his, uh, the exchange with the judge, I said to him at line 17, Professor, your evidence is you would take forward those three groups, you've identified three in, in the paper, in preference to the azido methyl, is it? And he says, I'm giving you examples of blocking groups that the skilled person would consider alongside azido methyl and Zabgarovny, and in my view, they would take first. So again, I, I accept the professor's evidence was that there was a, a bunch of, of, of compounds that you would take forward, three or four, um, uh, but it was certainly his evidence certainly wasn't that you would read as, as Zabgarovny and put it down and go off and do something else instead. Uh, and the judge's summary of, of the evidence in that way is, is not, a, not a fair one. Um, finally, at uh, 338, if your lordships would just, um, just read from 338, line 16, to 340, line 8. This is the last bit of evidence I'm asking you to read, and I'll just make a couple of submissions on that since you've done that. This is just to contrast the professor's attitude to the prior art and his desire to have experimental evidence to justify taking anything forward um, uh, uh, with his uh, or the judge's approach to the priority document, where um, the judge um, uh, was quite happy to consider that the invention was suitably supported, uh, enabled, uh, uh, and disclosed, even though that experimental evidence was absent in the priority document as compared to the uh, patent. Uh, and we say that, um, again, this, this underlies the, the um, inconsistency in the approach uh, of the judge. Uh, and so, if, having looked at that, if we can go back to the judgment, uh, and I'll see how the judge dealt with these issues. Um, firstly, in 201, well, even if there was an analogy between the blocking group uh, in Zabgarovny um, uh, and the idea of using a blocking group in sequencing by synthesis, that wouldn't make the invention obvious. It's 
skilled person did not think they needed a new group to try as a reversible chain terminator. The skilled person knew that there were numerous possible candidate groups and would be aware that there was a textbook into which, in which to find such things if they wanted help with thinking of some to try. And he refers to Green and Woods. And I refer your audience back to um, uh, uh, the uh, passage in the priority document, which similarly refers to Green and Woods. Um, uh, and that's why we say the priority document itself doesn't advance the skilled person any more than the common general knowledge. Um, uh, and for that reason, and on the basis that the judge approaches the issue here, that's why we, where we found our submission that um, if all that is required to satisfy the claims is a at least one incorporation, um, then on the assumption that there's a valid claim to priority, patent is merely disclosing an alternative blocking group, not a better one. Uh, and we have to reduce the inventive um, contribution to the same level that the priority document envisages. Uh, and if that's the case, um, the Azida Methyl group is a perfectly reasonable alternative from Zabgorodny, as Professor Ledley accepted. Um, it, it, it's one of a number of groups which would the skilled person would recognise in Zabgorodny as having potential for use in this sort of technique. Um, and if that is the hurdle at which the inventive uh, concept, technical contribution, is put, then um, the patent should have been found obvious over Zabgorodny um, uh, uh, if priority is maintained. Um, a, a similar point in paragraph 204, uh, the judge says, even if the skilled person got as far as considering whether to try out a Zedo methyl group, as a three prime blocking group on a nucleotide in a test of a single cycle, they would, as Professor Ledley explained, have no basis for thinking that such a blocked nucleotide would be incorporated into an oligonucleotide by DNA polymerase. It might or it might not. And again, um, uh, that uh, uh, is to be um, contrasted with the assumptions made on the priority document. There's no disclosure at all as to the uh, level of efficiency of any incorporation by polymerase in the priority document. No specific polymerase is identified. The skilled person would have precisely the same considerations and expectations from uh, Zabgorodny as the priority document. Um, and we say on that basis it's clear that the judge was inconsistent in his approach uh, as between obviousness and priority. Um, finally, uh, um, uh, we uh, oh yes, just while we pass, in, in 205, um, we made some submissions uh, that uh, the skilled person would recognise that because the azido methyl group is small, it might be incorporated uh, better than a larger molecule. That would be a reason to have an expectation um, of, of incorporation. That was rejected by the judge, um, but of course, um, uh, there was no such suggestion anywhere in the priority document to uh, support the notion that azido-methyl might be incorporated. Um, and there wasn't even the basis, therefore, in the priority document on size or whatever else to justify um, the judge's high expectation um, to satisfy the, all the features in paragraphs four and five. And again, we say this is an inconsistency. Um, finally, uh, we have paragraphs 209 and 210. Um, uh, which is uh, where the judge deals with uh, details about the removal conditions. Um, uh, and he holds, while the skilled person would think they could, they could come up with conditions in which to remove an azido methyl group without damaging DNA, that's not the only issue. To be useful in sequencing by synthesis, the removal has to have a reasonable yield and a reasonable speed. speed. In my judgment, the position is simply that the skilled person has no basis from which to infer there was a reasonable prospect of getting a reasonable yield and speed. And again, we, we contrast um, uh, the judge's recognition that the skilled person would need data experiments to underlie and to support the notion that reasonable speed uh, and yield were provided <coughs> um, and the absence of uh, such uh, data in the priority document. And we say, um, again, uh, this uh, shows the judge's inconsistent approach. Finally, the judge deals with the ICOS factors in 213, um, uh, and we say that um, they do uh, play in favour of uh, a finding of lack of inventive step based on the lower inventive concept that we say can only 
um, follow a finding of priority. Um, uh, uh, in little one, um, the judge deals with expectation of success. Of course, we say um, there was no expectation in the priority document, particularly if um, uh, on the judge's finding that it didn't matter whether that, that example was prophetic or not. Um, routine work, it is routine work, that's in favour of a finding of lack of inventive step. Uh, low cost, that is in favour of a finding of inventive step. Um, value judgments, none, none required, that's again in favour of a finding of lack of inventive step. So is five, multiple paths of research, doesn't apply here, that's in favour of a finding of lack of inventive step. Um, uh, motive, uh, we, we say that there is a squeeze there on the findings on the priority document given the absence of actual data in the priority document. Uh, and finally, in little seven, um, unexpected result. Again, we see the judge focusing in on the disclosure of paragraphs four and five of the patent. Um, uh, he finds that the three uh, prime Oazida Mutar blocking group has the useful features promised by the patent in paragraphs four and five. Um, he says that wasn't predictable from the prior art. Fair enough, if, 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 that's, if, that's, if that's the approach he wants to take. But if he does take that approach, he needs to apply that same standard to the priority document. Um, and he should have held that uh, the priority document does not support um, that same inventive concept. As, uh, and therefore, um, uh, little seven either uh, should have resulted in a lack of priority, or if um, there is a lack of priority, he was wrong to rely on this higher inventive step hurdle for the purposes, purposes of his analysis of Dabgrobny, and that so overall, um, applying all these factors, he should instead have found that the patent lacked inventive step. So, my lords, um, we submit that all these findings are consistent with our case uh, on appeal on priority. The judge was clearly inconsistent between the two. You've heard my reasons for the judge for overturning the judge on priority. Um, if we're wrong about that we, could, that, we say that can only be because he pitched the technical contribution too high. Um, if you ignore paragraphs four and five in the patent um, because uh, uh, they are not justified by the disclosure of the priority document um, uh, and judge inventive step on the basis that you're just looking for an alternative blocking group to the one set out in Green and Woods, then based on Professor Ledley's evidence, which I've shown you, it's clear that the skilled person would contemplate using azido methyl, albeit alongside other groups. After all, it's specifically called out at the end of the Zabgarov document. Um, uh, uh, you've seen Professor Ledley's evidence that it would be uh, uh, appropriate to use in Sanger sequencing, um, also in SBS, um, and you would have a similar expectation as for any other group to use in such a technique. And on this basis, uh, the judge should have found that the patent with its reduced inventive contribution, lacked inventive step. Well, unless I can assist you any further, those are our submissions, uh, both on priority and inventive step. Thank you. Uh, my lords, uh, if I may, um, I will take the question of uh, obviousness first, uh, because in our submission it properly contextualizes uh, the uh, issues uh, which are raised uh, on this appeal. Uh, and it should be remembered that the case uh, on priority uh, was only ever uh, advanced as a so-called squeeze argument finding propositions uh, which, uh, uh, if they uh, were to succeed uh, in order to find priority established, would inevitably result uh, in a finding of obviousness upon the patent. That was the only case advanced below. Uh, we quoted uh, in our skeleton argument um, the way it was advanced on the basis of uh, so-called lions uh, in the path. Uh, and we've explained in our skeleton, I think, uh, how uh, that simply doesn't work uh, in this case. Uh, the notion uh, of 
of a squeeze in this particular case uh, is in our submission uh, an extremely optimistic one. Uh, priority uh, is on the basis uh, of a document which positively teaches the use of the azidomethyl blocking group to modify a nucleotide uh, for the specific purpose at which the patent is aimed. It positively teaches uh, the creation of that modified uh, nucleotide product and provides an example which is said to have been carried out and which does in fact actually enable the invention. That's never been challenged. <laughs> Zavgorodny, the piece of prior art uh, which is said to give rise to the squeeze, uh, doesn't teach any such use, let alone uh, disclose or suggest uh, a modified nucleotide product, uh, either of the type the patent claims or indeed of any type. Uh, and we submit there is simply no mismatch between the factors which the judge uh, considered to establish priority based on P2 uh, and those which he considered uh, uh, did for, if I can put it colloquially, uh, the appellant's case of obviousness uh, on the basis of uh, Zav Um And um, <laughs> to put the case in a nutshell. The first big question in this case uh, was whether the skilled person uh, would have actually even thought about reversible chain terminating in SPS from a reading of Zavgorodny. That was a big problem for the appellants in this case because of course the law and obviousness seeks and must uh, avoid hindsight. It requires the court to consider how the skilled person uh, would have read the prior art document and what they would have thought about having read it uh, without any having any particular context uh, in mind. I can't be right. You don't read the prior art in a vacuum. Well, my lord, you read the prior art as a uh, person skilled in the art with all the common right. knowledge that you have. You okay, have no so and the judge has, has found, and there's no yeah. challenge to his finding, that the person skilled team is yeah. a team which is engaged in the field of sequencing by synthesis. Yes. So they are in that field. Right. He's also found that as a matter of chem common general knowledge, they are aware of the concept of RCTs for sure. that purpose. Yes. He's found that they don't know it will work and they don't have any prior expectation of success, if one can simplify it in that way. I think, if I may, he goes quite a lot beyond that to find, uh, in fact... But, but nevertheless, I mean, before you yes. develop the detail of yes. that, so the starting point is you've got a skilled team who are interested in SBS and are aware of RCTs. True. And that's the context in which you put Zavgorodny before them. Not, you don't read Zavgorodny in a complete vacuum. Well, I, I suppose it depends what one means by context. I, don't think, I doubt whether there's anything between it. Um, uh, if I may put it in the way uh, that it is often put, they have no particular expectation of the document. They don't expect it's going to help them. They don't expect it's going to help them, and they read it at face value. They take it as the document that it is. They don't take it as a document aimed at any particular purpose that they have in mind. That's what I was trying to get to by using the word context. So they come to it as a document which has a context of its own. It, this was a document. Uh, published in Tetrahedron Letters, which was aimed uh, generally at the organic chemist uh, and contained 
uh, general teaching uh, about uh, the use of blocking groups uh, here on nucleosides. So these are uh, molecules uh, which are not the nucleotides used in uh, a sequencing process, but molecules which have their own purpose often. Uh, as I think the judge says, as antivirals, uh, for example, or uh, in anti-cancer treatments. Uh, but what he's being taught is a process of synthetic chemistry. Uh, and this is not an unusual thing to find uh, in uh, a, uh, a paper of this kind, uh, that because in synthetic chemistry uh, it is important very often to have to block uh, one particular point on a molecule, uh, at one particular uh, position, perhaps, uh, on a benzene ring or whatever it is, uh, so that when you react the uh, chemical that you, the compound that you've got, with uh, a another chemical to create a synthetic molecule, which you're probably then going to produce many more to get to your ultimate goal, uh, you know which bit of the molecule is going to be reacted. So you're taking the relevant bit of the molecule out of the equation, uh, so far as that reaction is concerned. Uh, and that was what Zabgorodny was all about. It was teaching, uh, as Zabgorodny describes, a, a synthetic synthon which is this intermediate molecule created uh, in the course of what may be a lengthy uh, syn synthesis process uh, aimed at producing ultimately uh, a very different molecule. Uh, so it, it did have a particular context in the field uh, of um, uh, molecular chemistry. And <laughs> The first hurdle that the uh, appellant had to get over in this case uh, on the facts uh, was to show that the skilled team, who as my Lord or Justice Arnold has said, were working in SBS, but not specifically on SBS using RCTs. As you'll understand and as the judge found, um, the primary and indeed only commercialized uh, method of SPS, that was called pyrosequencing, Werner Quinn mentioned it this morning, uh, didn't use reversible chain terminators at all. Uh, indeed, the reaction uh, simply continued uh, without any uh, blocking uh, occurring. Um, there was another one that the judge refers to by Professor Church, which had been disclosed. Uh, which used a terminator that wasn't reversible. Uh, so there were options out there. And one of the things the judge needed to think about, and it's one of these cases where, I think as my Lord Lord Justice Lurson um, observed uh, in a case called Farge and Shabani, uh, there's a danger here of um, island hopping in a, in a sea of evidence. <laughs> but uh, uh, the judge heard a lot of evidence about the way in which uh, the uh, SBS art had developed. Uh, and one of the things that was clear was that this particular field, where the only published papers were from these two groups, um, the uh, Gibbs group um, and um, a, 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 another group in France, uh, those those papers and those groups who were investigating uh, the SBS by RCT process had published in 1994, but their last paper was in 1999 for both groups, and for both groups they had ultimately failed. Whilst they might have achieved an incorporation first time, they weren't able to repeat it. Uh, and uh, it looked by the priority date uh, as if uh, uh, their research had very much run into the ground. Uh, so this is not a particularly 
encouraging background uh, from which to think that the skilled person must inevitably have RCT in mind uh, and would come to documents uh, with the idea that this was very much a live project uh, and they were looking for, uh, as uh, Professor Marx uh, appeared to be proceeding on the basis of, they were looking for uh, an alternative RCT. Um, uh, that's a somewhat um, lengthy um, uh, introduction, but the point I'm getting at uh, is that the judge had in front of him and had to consider uh, the state of mind that one could properly uh, attribute to the notional artificial skilled person that one has to consider from the point of view of obviousness. Uh, and when he went through all the evidence and made all the findings that he did in judgment um, from well, it starts at uh, 103 and goes uh, right the way through uh, to 130. Uh, he drew uh, a number of conclusions um, uh, which uh, you find uh, from 195 of the judgment. Onwards. Uh, and um, what he concludes ultimately uh, is at 199. And he says, um, he recognizes the skilled person is deemed to read Zabgarodny with interest. They would see it was a paper concerned with chemical intermediates, synthon. They would see that one such intermediate was a nuclear side in which the 3 prime H had been blocked with Davido methyl. They would see the reference to removal using mild and specific conditions, and that Zavgorodny regarded that group as of special interest. In my judgment, the most likely thing such a team would think, having read Zavgorodny, that this based on synthetic chemistry had nothing to do with their focus on sequencing by synthesis. To the skilled person, the concept of protecting groups in synthetic chemistry is commonplace. At most, Zabgarodny would be seen as something to add to the organic chemist team members' general toolbox concerning chemical synthesis. See Professor Marks in cross-examination at T6729. Now, there is simply nothing absent hindsight to suggest that what is disclosed here as an application in relation to SBS using reversible chain terminators, they would read it with interest and having done so, put it down and move on. Now that is a finding uh, essentially of fact or evaluation from his findings of fact that the judge has in our submission properly made. There was plenty of basis for it. We had lots of evidence uh, about the Metzger um, prior art, that the Gibbs group, uh, and the other work that's been done. We have lots of evidence about uh, the attitude, uh, even of those people filing patents around the priority date, who didn't seem, as the judge found, uh, to be interested in new blocking groups at three prime. Uh, rather, if anything, they were moving on to look at completely different ways uh, of achieving RCT. Uh, for example, uh, blocking the four prime uh, or um, uh, making the base uh, a sterically hindering um, uh, aspect of the molecule. Um, so the judge had a volume of evidence that your lordships can't, in the time available, get to grips with. Uh, but the important thing in our submission from this point of view uh, is that. Zavgorodny never even gets to first base, so far as this claim is concerned. Zavgorodny uh, is held by the judge to be uh, a synthesis paper. Uh, it uh, would have been added to the chemist members, there was a 
organic chemist in the team, general toolbox for future use, uh, but it wasn't something which would have triggered uh, the question, well, can I use that uh, as an RCT? Um, given that finding, uh, one can see that there is uh, really uh, no relationship at all uh, between uh, the points that my learned friend is seeking to make in relation to priority and the points that arose on Zavka Rodney. Uh, the question was not, well, can we get Zavka Rodney to work, for example, which, put, in, put brutally, is his, his case uh, that he says uh, uh, emerges uh, on priority. The question here was, what I actually think of the relevance uh, that I need of Zavgorodny, from Zavgorodny at all. Uh, and having reached that conclusion in 199, which in my submission, um, and I'll go through the points that my own friend makes, uh, he's in no real position to challenge in this court. Uh, the whole case uh, on a squeeze case simply falls apart simply doesn't get to the stage uh, of considering uh, uh, any questions of enablement uh, or um, what it is that the priority document achieved. So it is teaching something which is neither disclosed nor obvious from Zabgarani, uh, namely uh, the use of this azido-methyl blocking group uh, for this specific uh, purpose. Uh, my, lord, my lords, the one might ask, why was it that we were staring at Zevka Rodney in this case? My learned friend has made an awful lot of uh, points this morning, founded on Metzger, uh, saying, well, where's the inventive contribution uh, compared to Metzger. But that wasn't his case on obviousness. He wasn't running obviousness based on Metzger, or indeed obviousness based on any of the sequencing by synthesis using RCT documents that he could have alighted on. Uh, indeed, as the judge records, uh, until shortly before trial, I think very shortly before exchange of skeleton arguments, he was running two cases of obviousness based on SBS by RCT prior art, uh, Cien and Ju, which were two uh, patent filings. And the reason those weren't, weren't pursued, we surmise, is because they didn't get uh, close to the invention either, because Neither of them proposed azetamethyl as a blocking group. They put forward various other alternatives, nor made it obvious to find it. So having ditched the actual prior art that gave them the building blocks of SBS and the basis upon which we might say the inventive step arose uh, uh, over um, uh, what was known in this art, uh, they decided to alight on this somewhat obscure document, which wasn't in the field at all. Does that matter? It doesn't matter, except... You, you're assumed to read everything, aren't you? Uh, my lord, yes. But the question is, um, whilst one reads it with interest, without hindsight, uh, what is the basis for thinking that the inventive concept would have come to you, uh, having seen the document? In other words, you read, you read everything, you read it all with interest, but you don't read it with any expectation it's going to be of any relevance to sequencing by... Precisely. Yeah. You come to the document... Un un unless, unless when you read it you think, well, this, yes. this, would, be a, this would work for, yeah. for SBS. You come to the document with no particular expectation. So the point your Lordship made was exactly why this particular debate before the judge was so critical because if they couldn't get over that hurdle, the skilled team would have said, oh, wow, this is 
which is great, we can use this uh, for RCT uh, in SPS, then the whole case fell to pieces. And that's exactly what happened uh, uh, when the judge uh, stood back and said, look, let's just try and get hindsight out of the way. It's a terrible problem in a patent case, as your logic's aware, because one's looking back constantly through the prism uh, of the invention and the patent uh, to see whether one can find the elements of the claim either disclosed or obvious uh, in the prior art. But one's then got to do that as if the patent never existed. Uh, and that's, that's the difficulty that judges are faced with day in, day out. What would the national team have done um, if they would seen this particular document? Because one has to be fair to patentees as well as being fair to people trying to revoke patents. And the, the rule that permits any document uh, to be the basis of a document, uh, uh, a, an obviousness defense, uh, is alleviated in court by the rule that says, but yeah, you have to do that without hindsight. Uh, you've got to do it uh, as if uh, the reader came to it with no particular expectation. Um, we do submit it's telling that the uh, appellants uh, uh, didn't feel able to attack this patent based on actual SPS technology. Uh, because, of course, when they come to uh, the attack on priority, uh, they're constantly um, going back to what they say was known and established uh, in the SPS art. And when, when referred to Metzger, uh, on a large number of occasions. Metzger was the 1994 paper, which by 1999 uh, was research that had simply got nowhere. Uh, and it was established, as the judge found, that the skilled person would have been aware of that. Uh, so uh, it wasn't itself uh, a, uh, a promising lead uh, in this field. Um, The judge went on to make uh, a series of findings from paragraph um, after paragraph 199, um, which um, are in fact backup findings. So if you, if you go to 201, you'll see you see how this emerges. He's already found in 199 that the skilled team would read it with interest. Uh, they wouldn't see its relevance to SBS by RCT, uh, and therefore would put it down and move on. He could have stopped there. He goes on from 201 to make uh, a series of backup findings, uh, which um, deal with uh, the situation, well, what if some analogy had been recognized by the skill team between blocking the three prime of the nuclear side as part of the synthetic uh, process of Zevgorodny and the idea of blocking the three prime end of the nuclear tide in sequencing by synthesis. And he says that even that wouldn't make the invention obvious. Uh, and he then turns to uh, aspects of the evidence which are relevant in particular to motivation and expectation of success. And those are matters uh, which have been held to be highly relevant factors in any consideration of uh, obviousness. Uh, and what he finds, first of all, as you see in 201, uh, is another critical finding. The skilled person didn't think they needed uh, a new group uh, to try uh, as uh, a reversible chain terminator. Uh, and you may say, well, um, why is that the case? Um, 
Well, the judge has already made a series of findings that my learned friend um, didn't refer you to from paragraph 122 onwards. I think he took you to paragraph 122. But there are then a series of actual findings on the evidence that the judge made which explain uh, why uh, this particular point uh, was found the way it was by the judge. And first he says, well, there's, there's no lack of chemical groups uh, to try as protecting groups. Um, again, it's a hindsight problem when one's looking purely at um, the azidomethyl in, uh, in Zavgorodny and thinks, oh, well, here's a, here's a protecting group, why not use that? But of course, as far as the organic chemist is concerned, there are thousands of protecting groups out there. There's an entire textbook of protecting groups. So what is it that Zavgorodny is really giving them? They're just telling them, well, we used one particular uh, protecting group. Um, I don't think it matters, but just for my own curiosity, yeah. can you first of all tell me what's the date of Green and Woods? There were various editions of Green and Woods. Right. I think 99 was the most recent. OK. Um, and was um, Zavgorodny cited in Green and Woods? No. Azidomethyl is mentioned in Green and Woods, um, although, um, yeah, there, are, there was a debate at trial as to the relevance of the particular chapter in Green and Woods that it was contained in. But you should, if we're going back into the history of the case, the, uh, the case put on the basis of the SBS prior art, which was Cien and Jew, was, well, the skilled person would take Cien and Jew and then go to Green and Watts to try and find some um, reversible chain terminal to blocking group. And there he would find azidomethyl in chapter 3 uh, in, in the place that it was cited. And I think azidomethyl had been itself mentioned uh, in a paper which is cited in Green and Watts called Lubidu. Luby New. <laughs> Sounds like a children's TV character. Um, but uh, uh, that, that, of course, all fell away. But the judge did hear evidence about, about Green and Watts and its, and its relevance. It's, it's a well-known uh, textbook on, on blocking groups. Um, and second, um, he says the papers concerned with reversible chain terminators were not suggesting what was required to overcome their absence of success was to test new chemical groups as reversible chain terminators. And just to unpack that, we're talking here about uh, the Gibbs group uh, and the Canard group, uh, the two groups that had published between uh, 1999 uh, and 2000, and, sorry, 1994 and, two, and 1999. Um, and what they had not said in all their papers discussing what they were doing was we're struggling because we think we're using the wrong protecting group. They used some protecting groups, they tended to stick with them uh, and there's not a single whiff of a suggestion in those papers that you need to go out and find some more and that, that might potentially be a solution to the problem. The third point he makes at, uh, at 125 relates to the patent applications which were filed uh, around the priority date uh, of the work which independent groups were doing. And they weren't trying new potential reversion chain terminators at the three prime. Um, this was evidence which the appellants filed. And when we looked at it, it became clear that there was very little support for the obviousness case there. And if in fact it's in pointing the opposite direction. As the judge says, one group, Amisham, was interested in making modifications at four prime. The other group was Genovox. Their approach was to avoid pursuing three prime modifications 
and instead putting a sterically demanding group on the base. Professor Marx, and this was a key point of the evidence, accepted that this approach of Jenna Box was a fair reflection of the attitude of those in the art at the time. I infer that Jenna Vox were well aware of the earlier proposals to use RCTs at the three prime position and didn't lack ideas for alternative groups to that location, but took an entirely different approach. And that's where the judge concludes at 126 about the state of mind uh, and the common general knowledge of the skilled person. Um, and uh, his finding uh, that um, although they knew uh, in general terms what they needed to make it work, uh, there was no specificity as to any particular problem or problems that had to be solved so as to take this forward. Um, uh, so those were the judge's findings as to the state of mind of the skilled person uh, in 2002. And one begins to understand, having just read through that, and, and of course your lordships haven't had the benefit of seeing all the evidence, but why the judge drew the conclusion that he did at 199, well, the skilled person just, it wasn't, it wasn't at the forefront of his mind, this idea of finding a new reversible chain test. So why would he seize on Zabgarov? He had all sorts of other things if he wanted to. And then secondly, as the judge uh, has said at 203, um, sorry, at, uh, at 201, that the skilled person didn't even think that the problem lay uh, in finding a new group at all. And what the judge then does from 202 uh, is to deal with some of the points, and, and this goes right the way through to 210, uh, some of the points that were being made by the appellant to try and counter that argument. Because what they were trying to do was say, well, when one sees Zavgorodny, and what is actually said in Zavgorodny, it would have caught the attention of somebody who knew about RCTs and suggested itself as a particular application in which it could be used. And on the facts, again, he rejects that. There was a, there was a lot of reliance on the fact that Zabgorodny, as he mentions in 203, talks about being able to be removed under specific and mild conditions. But the judge says that's got nothing to do with the conditions necessary for DNA synthesis. And indeed, the actual conditions proposed by Zabgorodny simply wouldn't have been suitable to uh, removal uh, in the situation of DS DNA synthesis because they would have destroyed the growing chain. Um, 204, um, obviously there's no teaching in Zabgorodny that you could incorporate this into an oligonucleotide uh, using a DNA polymerase. Um, so it might or might not. In 205, they relied on the fact that it was small as a group. Uh, as the judge points out, even when one looks back at Metzger, which is the original disclosure uh, in this field, some small groups worked, some didn't. Some that were a lot smaller than Zito Methyl didn't work. Uh, other large groups worked. So there, wasn't, there was nothing in that. And then they got even more imaginative and they said, well, what about AZT, the, the anti-AIDS drug? Um, that's got an azide uh, blocking group um, at the OH, um, although it's not a azidomethyl, uh, nor is it a three prime uh, oxygen there. Um, but the judge um, uh, uh, says, no, uh, that wouldn't... Uh, that wouldn't cause it to come to mind either. Uh, he says in 208, um, a skilled person just wouldn't think of it as having any relevance. Uh, and it doesn't in any event provide a reasonable prospect of success because the differences in chemical structure are so great. Um, uh, and then uh, he says, well, you'd need in any event to be 
thinking, well, there's some reasonable yield and reasonable speed here. Uh, and you don't get that from Zabgarun. Um, all this, as we'll see, you do get from the priority document <laughs> that it happened. Uh, it tells you about reasonable yield. It tells you about reasonable speed. Uh, it, it discloses that it is incorporated via polymerase. Uh, all these steps uh, that uh, are just completely missing from Zabgarov, on the basis of which the judge said uh, you just wouldn't have the idea, are there in the priority document. So where is this squeeze? Um, and in, uh, in the judge's conclusion, um, as he dismissed all the arguments that were being made, um, there was nothing to either suggest the idea, the idea in the first place or make you think about the field, uh, and there was nothing that would give you any encouragement at all uh, that this might be a useful or successful uh, a process to adopt. And <coughs> when the judge finds, so one looks at uh, his findings, as we will do, <coughs> on the subject of priority, uh, the judge boldly dismisses the suggestion, which was the only case being run, that there was a squeeze on obviousness. In my submission, he was quite plainly right. Uh, the Zabgorodny disclosure was a million miles from the priority document. And the problems that underlay the case which was being put uh, on the basis of Zabgorodny simply didn't exist as problems uh, on the question of priority. Uh, we were talking about uh, two completely different arguments. Um, and the learned friend, I think, tends to haver in this appeal between uh, trying to run a straight up and down priority attack uh, and running his real case, which is the squeeze, because he finds it very difficult to face up to the reality of the differences between these documents, which are huge. Um, but he's not, never has run uh, a... Um, straightforward attack uh, on the uh, priority uh, of the pattern based on GT. Uh, and in our submission, uh, at one one scene, uh, the differences between Zabgorodny and the priority document and the specific findings on the facts and multitudinous evidence which the judge makes, um, that squeeze case plainly uh, is never going to work. <clears throat> um, my Lords, I want to turn, if I may now, to look at uh, the question of plausibility and the law that applies uh, to yes. priority. Yes, um, it may be that this is an issue you want to address in that context rather than in the context of obviousness, and if so, that's absolutely fine. Yes. But you will appreciate that a major theme of Mr. Mitchison's submissions was the inventive contribution of the patent. Yes. And what he submitted was an inconsistency between the inventive contribution that the judge took as his premise for assessment of obviousness and the inventive contribution he took as his premise for the assessment of priority. Yes, and I think what I've done when I've looked at obviousness is to show you why the case on obviousness failed. Uh, and it but wasn't you haven't yet uh, identified the inventive contribution that you say well, uh, yes. was present in the patent in that context. Well, we say the inventive contribution is the provision uh, of uh, an azidomethyl blocking group as a reversible chain terminator at the three prime position uh, on a nucleotide. A 
thus enabling at least one incorporation step. Because as the judge found uh, in paragraph 297, <coughs> that's all that's required, even by the claim 12 process claim that he was looking at. We, we would say it's not actually required even for uh, claim 1. Uh, sorry, it's not actually required for claim 1, which is a product claim. Um, but when one's looking at the utility this molecule. Uh, that is the inventive contribution. That is all the patentee needs to show. He's, he's produced something, as the judge found, of utility, because even sequencing a single molecule has utility. Sorry, a single nucleotide uh, in the chain has utility. And there is no need for me to go beyond that. Why? I can understand that submission, but what then is the relevance of the so-called stringent requirements in paragraphs four and five of the patent? And again, maybe you want to address that in the context of priority. Well, in some senses, um, uh, not particularly. I mean, th those are requirements uh, which um, ultimately one was looking for and which ultimately are provided, and indeed are provided by, by the uh, invention. We know uh, it's never the, the case on lack of sufficiency um, uh, failed, uh, and the judge held that uh, those um, requirements were satisfied. But it isn't a requirement of upholding priority uh, or even of identifying an inventive concept. Uh, that the patentee demonstrates that he has achieved all the goals that he may have set for himself uh, in the specification. The question is, has he made any technical contribution? Not, has he made an all-singing, all-dancing contribution, which is absolutely perfect. I mean, I will come and look at paragraphs four and five. They were, uh, they've been referred to so often by the learned friends. What we will actually say is, even on the face of the priority document, there is no reason to suppose that these aren't satisfied. Indeed, what the priority document tells you in its description of the example reads on uh, to the stringent requirements, which I think were so-called stringent requirements in paragraph five. Because what the, the patentee is doing uh, in the priority document is saying, look, here is a um, here is a modified nucleotide, modified in such a way that it can be uh, incorporated with efficiency uh, into a growing nucleotide chain um, and blocks efficiently, which is obviously another one of the stringent requirements, and can be removed under specific conditions at 100% yield. These are the key elements of the process uh, of uh, sequencing uh, using SPS uh, and reversible chain termination. Uh, all that is taught, and it's not suggested that it isn't enabled. No one's saying that what is taught by way of an example in the priority document doesn't work. <laughs> That's somewhat extraordinary case where no expert evidence challenging the disclosure in the priority document, so far as its utility is concerned, um, was advanced. Well, that's always the case with plausibility arguments. Plausibility only becomes relevant in patent cases when it's found out after the event that it does work. Otherwise, there'd be no bone for the dogs to fight over. Well, I'll come to, I'll come to the law on uh, uh, 
uh, on enablement and priority. Um, but um, the norm, I would suggest, um, uh, outside the field of um, second medical use cases, where obviously you can only prove things uh, after the event, by definition, Um, uh, is one attacks the priority document on the basis that it's not enabling, it doesn't work. And that is the key requirement of a priority document after all. It has to enable the invention. Uh, and in this case, that's never been denied. Um, can we look at the law? Okay. Um, yeah, just before we do that, yes. I'm right in thinking that you need to have the same invention in the priority document as you do in the patent. Yes. The invention of the claims must be disclosed uh, in the priority document. How do we identify the invention in the patent? It's what's in the claims. But the claim, claim one is just a molecule. We yeah. are told that's not inventive. Well, that is the invention because the claim is under the uh, EPC and under, under our Patents Act, um, the invention is defined by the claim. So what the priority document has to do is to disclose the invention and enable the claim. Um, there's, I think you, what, where your Lordship's going, I think, is this idea of um, what is your technical contribution over the prior art or general knowledge or whatever it may be um, and um, do we find that in the priority document and almost inevitably you'd have to in order to enable the claim uh, and in this case plainly in our submission we do because the priority document discloses exactly the thing uh, which forms the basis of the claims the ability to incorporate the um, uh, the use of the compound in SBS by RCT, uh, the deblocking, all that's necessary to successfully uh, incorporate uh, uh, and deblock a molecule in a chain. Okay. okay, well, it might be a convenient point at this juncture, since this topic has been raised, to have a look at what I said in. Edenix, at paragraph 178. So this is joint authorities, um, bundle 2, tab 13, page 172 of the bundle, paragraph 178 at the foot of the page. So mm -hmm. I introduce the uh, yeah. application, but with an explanation of why it is that I'm looking at the application and not at the text of the granted patent. And I give two reasons. Mm -hmm. Firstly, there's a, there was an allegation of additive matter. Yeah. And then I say, this. The second is that, as Counsel for Gilead submitted, the question of plausibility must be tested by reference to the contents of the application. If the claimed inventions are only plausible when considered by reference to the contents of the patent and not when considered by reference to the contents of the application, yeah. then it must follow that the patent is invalid for added matter. Yeah. That, of course, does not Accurate apply. Accurate statement of the law or wrong? Well, I'm sure that's right, but it doesn't apply in the case of priority course, it's well known that one can add matter between the priority document and the patent application. But the tests for priority and added matter are, if not identical, very similar. Well, well, Why would the principle be any it's, different? It's commonplace to introduce, for example, updated or new experimental evidence in applications as filed, as one can see from some of the TBA authorities. Um, and the reason for doing that, presumably, is to provide more uh, support uh, 
to uh, the uh, invention when it comes to be assessed on the basis of sufficiency, um, uh, inventive contribution. More support, yes. But, but you test plausibility by reference to what, uh, if there's no issue on priority, what's in the application as filed, and you discount the later filed evidence. And the same principle applies one step backwards if there is an issue on priority. Why well, would it not? What's the, the logic for is, treating it differently? Well, the question is, what is the issue on priority, in my submission? So we're not looking at an added matter problem. We're looking at whether these claims are entitled to priority from this document. And, and it's got to be the that, same invention. And if it's, if, if it's yes. not the same invention, yes. then two consequences follow. Yes, I agree. You lose priority and there's added matter. I agree. And the same invention is... Is the invention disclosed? Yes, it is. The azido-methyl modified nucleotide is disclosed in the priority document as much oh, as right, it's disclosed in the Can you help me on, on this? Because th th this, this then feeds into the other question that I was discussing with Mr. Mitchison, which is the judge has proceeded on the basis that plausibility is required as a matter of law well, for the purposes of priority. He doesn't rule out the priority tag on the basis no. that it's irrelevant as a matter of law, no. and you've got no respondent's notice on that. Right, well, when I, when I heard your lordship make that point, I'm a landed friend. Um, uh, in my submission, let's have a look at uh, what the judge said, first of all, on uh, priority. Because I'm going to say that this is, quite, this is simply not a matter. Uh, on which we can be um, uh, uh, criticised for not putting a respondent's notice or required to make a respondent's notice uh, before uh, being able to argue uh, that plausibility uh, is not uh, uh, relevant to this particular case. So, what the judge found in paragraph 240, and of course, there's no discussion of the law, but what he says is the conclusion the claims are entitled priority must follow. He says the same invention is disclosed in both the priority document and the patent. That's his finding. And he says the disclosure in the priority document supports the claims and is an enabling disclosure. And he goes on, it also provides plausible information which supports the idea of the sequencing by synthesis scheme based on the claim three oazidum methyl blocking group uh, will work. So he's found all the facts which on my submission uh, are enough uh, to uh, amount to priority. He's found an enabling disclosure and he's found that the invention is disclosed. Uh, he's also found, as he says, uh, that there's plausible uh, but why, why would he consider work. plausibility if it was legally irrelevant? He returns to the subject in 241. He says it doesn't render what is described any less plausible. Why is he considering plausibility at all if it's legally wholly irrelevant? Well, my Lord, I think there's two questions. One, is it legally wholly irrelevant? And we submit that it is. Two, what are the consequences if the judge thought it was? He makes the finding in our favour, so there's nothing to appeal. And he makes all the other findings that we need uh, in our favour, so we don't need to appeal. There is nothing here on which we would need to file a respondent's notice, nor does he even say, um, uh, as a matter of law, that he holds that plausibility is actually a requirement. I mean, yes, well, because he he'd already it. held that in Hospir and Genentech, so well, no doubt in the absence of any submission well, that he'd been wrong in or spear and genetic, he took it as red. Sadly, my lord, we're no longer in a position to appeal his decision in <laughs> spear and genetic. However, we actually agree with his decision in spear and genetic because it's about a second medical use case and it has all those different characteristics. But my lord, uh, standing back, we would invite your lordship to consider that uh, this is not a matter on which we're obliged to challenge a finding of the judge of any kind because he hasn't made a finding against us uh, on this at all. Uh, the, the, 
The bizarre result, if we were wrong, is that your lordships would be being invited to... It's, no, it's, it's not a question of challenging the judges. It's an, an alternative reason. So the alternative reason is that plausibility is legally irrelevant. Well, my lord, the alternative reason, as we would put it, uh, is the reason the judge has already found that the invention is disclosed, the disclosure supports the claims, and is an enabling disclosure. And that we've already got. What we say, when Malone and Friend appeals, what we say is, well, just winning on plausibility is not going to be good enough to get you home. And that is not something the judge has found against us on. He hasn't said, I needed to make this finding, otherwise you would have lost. So there is technically uh, nothing for us to put a respondent's notice in on, nor is anyone prejudiced here because this point came out in our skeleton argument uh, very clearly uh, many weeks ago. Well, that's And it is correct. a point of law, uh, and everyone has had the opportunity to deal with it. And I was coming to the point that it would be a somewhat bizarre position uh, if your lordships were going to look at this case uh, on the basis of a proposition of law which might be wrong uh, without considering the proposition of law. Now, I can see that that might happen uh, in some cases where it was held that it was a clear case where a respondent's notice needed to go in, but I would admit if, if he'd said in, from such a case. If he'd said in 240, it's the same invention, it's disclosed, and it's enabling, but that is not enough. As yeah. a matter of law, I need to find also that it's plausible. Yes. And then you could have put a response notice in saying, no, it was enough. He, he should have stopped at the first two sentences and, and, and that, that was enough. We could have done, yes. Yeah. I, I agree we could have done. We're in that grey area, I would submit. It's not, it's not one of those cases where there's a positive finding that you've got to overturn. Yeah. Because we say it actually works the other way. The question is, what happens if a friend overturns this? Um, you say it still doesn't get him home. We say it still doesn't get him home because we've got all these findings. <laughs> you say he could have stopped at the end of the third sentence. In we two, do. 240. Did you say he should have stopped? Because at 235, yes. he recalls, I assume correctly, yeah. that the legal test for priority was not in dispute. Yes. Well, it, <laughs> it wasn't because Icecape only talks about enabling disclosure. Uh, and that's the case that he cites. Um, the the whole plausibility thing really um, was not um, something that we were um, thinking was going to be a factor because of course um, when one looked at the evidence as, as my Lord Lord Justice Arnold has pointed out already uh, there was no challenge to the plausibility of what was disclosed in the priority document <laughs> We've gone all the way through the trial with, with no one suggesting that the priority document didn't make the invention plausible. The one thing we've dealt with this in our skeleton, the one thing that was said was, well, I'd be a bit sceptical about the 100% yield cited. But that's nowhere near a suggestion that the invention is not made plausible, uh, and particularly the way the evidence came out even on that point. Okay, well, that's an important point you just made, and I, I want to bottom that out a little. So I asked um, Mr. Mitchison whether there was any evidence, as opposed to submission, that example one was prophetic, and he conceded that there was no evidence. No. As I understand it, you've just gone a little further than that, oh. and you say not only was there no evidence that example one was prophetic, you say there was no evidence that it was not plausible yes. either. Yes, absolutely. Right. Thank you. And, and to be honest, we, we, we're hardly surprised about that because the example that's actually given is one which works. Nobody seems to suggest it doesn't work. And that's the slightly yeah, bizarre thing about this case. But as I said earlier, the issue, these issues only become relevant yes. in circumstances where you find out later that it yes. works. But, yes. The question is, would you I think find I it plausible without the yes. subsequent experimental proof? Well, 
Well, I better get on to the law because um, we say this is dealt with by an assumption in one of Lambert's in a passage which we have cited but only friend didn't cite when he read through the judgment. Uh, and it's a pretty critical distinction. Um, so your Lordship's seen, I think, the authorities on priority generally. And I'm not going to go back to those. But they are summarised in I uh, And what they say is you have to uh, disclose in an enabling way uh, the invention. Essentially, um, it's a test of uh, enablement, which we are uh, very familiar with in other contexts uh, in patent law. Uh, and the question is, how does that turn into, in an enablement case, and I'm not talking about um, yeah, the problem with all of these discussions is it always depends on what you mean. So yes. do we mean enablement in the sense of classical insufficiency, or do we mean enablement in the sense of biogen insufficiency? Well, because if we mean the latter, that takes you straight into breadth of claim, which takes you on to plausibility. Well, yes, except breadth of claim. In, in this case, breadth of claim was not being run as, as, as any kind of problem. But he, of course it is. It's the same invention. And therefore, well, it, you're inherently into breadth of claim. Well, only if there is some reason to suppose uh, that the skilled person would have difficulty in implementing inventions of the scope of work. All those arguments were rejected uh, uh, on the sufficiency case, and they weren't put forward uh, as part of the priority case. Yeah. Um, so, but let me just show you, if I can, uh, the relevant passage in uh, Lord Sumption, uh, which is in Warner Lambert. It's in the authorities bundle at tab 16. And this, as closely as we could ever put it in our submission, um, points up um, the the reason why in enablement cases, um, uh, and of course in, um, in Warner Lambert they were looking at a, uh, a sufficiency objection across the breadth of the claim, uh, that um, the question of plausibility may arise. Uh, and he starts at the bottom of 752 by saying, it's more exact to say it's that sufficiency is a statutory rule fundamental to the public interest that justifies the issue of the patent. The contribution of judges is to work out principle of, principles on which it can be applied to Swiss form patents. Then he goes on in this passage, which we submit as important. Section 14 of the Patents Act and the corresponding provisions of the EPC assume that an invention will be sufficiently disclosed if the specification enables it to be performed. Uh, in the case of a patent for a new product or process, that assumption is almost always correct. The skilled person will discover that it works by replicating it in accordance with the specification. But the assumption is not correct in the case of a second use patent. The invention isn't the compound or the process of its manufacture. A skilled person already knows how to make the product in the prior art. Invention consists of the new purpose for which the product is to be manufactured. Uh, and then he says, if the sections are to be read literally, uh, all the needs to be disclosed is a new purpose, which is enough to enable it to be administered. The skilled person doesn't need to know how or why the invention works in order to replicate it. The result would be the knowledge of the application of the new purpose invented need not be disclosed at all. And Elsewhere, in relation to Swiss form and second medical use claims, he makes the point that um, technically they can't really be enabled because those claims are for the use of a compound in a treatment. And by definition, you can't use a compound uh, in a treatment without getting the necessary authorization to do so. Uh, and you can't establish that it works in a treatment either for that purpose or indeed probably for the purpose of the patent, uh, without doing uh, medical trials, which take, uh, as is notorious, uh, many years. Uh, and 
unless it's a vaccine against COVID. But, <laughs> but uh, in general, they take many years. Um, and the prospect, therefore, of a patentee being able to enable the use in a treatment at the time he applies for his patent is remote. And for that reason, where we have mitigation as well as assumption proceeds, we permit these patents to be granted on the basis not that you've actually enabled it, but that it's yeah, plausible. But again, it depends on what you mean by enable, because of course it enables it, because it tells you what the, the medicament is, mm -hmm. and it tells you who to administer it to and what for what purpose. Yes. You and you find out whether it works by doing it yes. in accordance with the specification. So actually, there's no difference in that regard. Say the point that, is, yes. is what have you actually contributed to human knowledge yes. if it's speculation? Yes. And that's where plausibility comes. Yes. And the question, but if you can replicate it in accordance with the specification, which is the case for almost all new products and all processes, then as Lord Sumption said, you have enabled it. So if what you've done is teach the skilled person how to make your compound uh, and teach the use, uh, then you have enabled both the uh, making of the compound and the use. Um, it's much more difficult, I would suggest, normally with a second medical use, to say that you have enabled the treatment, uh, because at least at the date of the patent, one could never establish that. Uh, it would have to be established by yes, much but later. If all evidence. that was required was, as he puts it, discover it works by replicating it in accordance with the specification, that's inherently post patent. So it's exactly the same. You, you would right. discover it works by right. doing what yes. the specification for the second medical use tells you to do. Yes. There's no difference. Right. But um, can we look at. Um, Yes, there are other, perhaps other parts of the judgment which put this into uh, some context, which we've referred to, I think, in our skeleton argument. Um, if I can just find them. Yeah. Yeah, so... If your Lordship looks at paragraph 40, for example, in the specific, specific context. Of well, before we get on to that, can we look at paragraph 23? Yeah. Where he says in the first sentence, the concept of plausibility originates in the case law of the EPO as a response to overbroad claims, in particular claims to whole classes of chemical compounds supported by a description which fails to show right. that the compounds can be expected to work. Right. So that's not second medical use, no. and it's t the question it's posing is where you've got a claim to a class of chemical compounds, do they work on the yeah. basis of what's in the specification? Well, you will generally have described one uh, and taught the skilled person how it works, and then the question is, <laughs> uh, uh, is it plausible that the breadth of the claim that you've sought reflects that? Disclosure or is supported by that disclosure. Indeed. Yeah. Um, uh, and that, um, that is a slightly different aspect uh, of sufficiency to do with uh, whether you've provided well, it's any. Not, it's support. not just sufficiency, it's inventive step, because as he explained, this, this, Sorry, this yes, will came up with Grievo, which is an inventive step. Yes. <laughs> so it's both sides of the coin. It is, it is. Uh, and as ever with these concepts, they are coloured to some extent by the particular legal background against which they yeah. are judged. And uh, priority is, is a slightly unusual one, um, because of course it is inevitably followed by the application itself within 12 months. Uh, and the question is, um, what is the test as far as priority is concerned? And, and one thing is certain is he doesn't address priority at all. No, he doesn't. So I interrupted you. You yeah. wanted to go to 40, was it? Yeah, so 40 is where I think he's, he's drawing a... He's saying why there's a particular problem uh, with um, second medical use claims. And um, this is in the context of an argument about later published data. 
Um, but if you look around about the second hole punch, the question is not whether it worked. Um, so he's talking about a situation where you've been through clinical trials uh, and you're not going to be litigating a patent unless that's been achieved. The question is not whether it works, but whether the contribution to the art consisting of the discovery that it can be expected to work has been sufficiently disclosed in the patent. The inherent difficulty of demonstrating this before clinical trials is taken into account in the modest standard, i.e. plausibility, which is applied to testing. So he does seem to be saying there that the um, plausibility test applies specifically to second medical use cases, which this entire judgment is carefully hedged around. He, he, he makes it clear on a number of occasions that that's all he's talking about. Um, because, of course, um, it may be said that merely establishing that something is plausible, particularly if it's a medical treatment, is not really the same as enabling it. <laughs> because just be, as a doctor, uh, if you thought, well, it's plausible this drug might might be useful to treat this particular uh, illness, um, you probably wouldn't get much credit from the GMC if you started handing it out to patients simply on the back of that, uh, uh, on that particular analysis. And so it is a it is a relatively modest test, um, uh, which he is uh, explaining there, and therefore specifically. The other, the other issue that arises that if, if you've got a, a document, a priority document or an application or a patent, uh, which uh, does describe what you are claiming and does give you a recipe for making it and does tell you how to use it, um, what more is it that is really being required? What, how how about the test he proposes here? Whether the contribution to the art consi consisting mm. in the discovery that it can be expected to work has been sufficiently disclosed in the patent or here the priority document? Yes. Well, if you say, I've done this experiment, <laughs> it works. Ah, yes. But then that's, that's a point of the facts and all the law. Well, <laughs> one does get to the potentially slightly odd position that you do all that, let's say you've done the experiment of the patent, so you've assured, you have uh, assured yourself that it works and you teach that it works in a way that can be replicated by the reader. Are you to lose your patent because the reader is surprised that it does work? I mean, we, g we gave the um, somewhat mythical example of the, um, well only partially mythical uh, the Leonardo uh, helicopter, which actually doesn't work as drawn because um, the um, the men standing turning the uh, turning the wheel would be far too heavy to permit the thing to take off. But let's assume for a moment <laughs> that it had worked. Um, but everybody who saw it would have thought, "No, there's no way that's going to work. That's extraordinary." It took a genius of Leonardo's type recognize that it worked and in fact he had taught you exactly all you needed to know to get it to work. We would say it would be extraordinary in such circumstances if um, Mr. Leonardo was to lose his patent uh, because it simply wasn't plausible to his ignorant readers who didn't have his level of genius when he had in fact enabled the invention to be carried out. Does it matter whether it's on the basis of actual experiments or prophetic? Well, um, I gave the example, I think, to illustrate um, the potential unfairness of the rule. But in my submission, no, it doesn't matter. Because if, in fact, the prophetic experiments can be carried out, uh, and you therefore have enabled the invention to, take, to, to be uh, implemented, uh, what more could be required of you? Barely, uh, as a patentee. I mean, one gets to the situation, I mean, we're nearly at the situation in this case, where they say, oh, well, you didn't put the pictures of the gels in the priority document. I mean, 
is, is enablement to turn on the precise quality of the photographs of the experiment which has been carried out um, is uh, which and, and are replicated uh, in the patent specification if in fact following the teaching of the patent does get you within the claim we would submit plainly not and that's why we would ask your lordships to consider whether plausibility in the sense being considered by Lord Sumption really makes any sense as a as it were a secondary burden which uh, an applicant for a patent needs to satisfy uh, and that was uh, I think what the Technical Board of Appeal were getting at in GEMVAX now it's obviously a slightly different case because <coughs> GEMVAX was uh, a a medical use patent. But it was a case where enablement was conceded um, on the basis of the priority document. But it was said, but it's not plausible. Look, it was said, the patentee has put forward some further, ex some actual experiments in his patent application, and they're not to be found in the priority document. Um, so it was said, it was argued, it's therefore not plausible on the basis of the priority document. And the TBA said, well, that's irrelevant. There is no basis for requiring further steps other than that which is required simply to enable the invention to be performed. Uh, and we would submit that is the right approach for good, uh, logical, and fair reasons. Um, if I could maybe take you to that briefly. Um, it's in tab 24. I think you've seen it already, but it's an important decision in our submission. Uh, it's quoted in the um, uh, in the case law of the appeal published by uh, the EPA uh, on this particular point. Uh, and uh, you'll see the the reasons. Um, from um, they start at tab nine, uh, paragraph nine on page nine hundred and seventy. Uh, and they're dealing first of all with the decision G two ninety eight, which underlies uh, the law in this area, uh, and they refer to. Um, selection patterns um, uh, and they conclude at the end of paragraph 9 that priority claims should not be acknowledged if the selection mentioned in question are considered novel according to these criteria. The board considers it of, of utmost importance to strictly apply the criteria set out by the Enlarged Board of Appeal when assessing entitlement to priority. In the present case, the selection of the specific peptides of those ID numbers from the disclosure of the priority document is not considered to result in novel subject matter, uh, since the selection is made from only one list of entries. Therefore, subject matter is directly and unambiguously derivable uh, from the priority document. And then in 11, uh, since the enablement of the disclosure has not explicitly has explicitly not been challenged by appellant two, the board doesn't consider it appropriate to doubt that the priority document discloses the claim dimension in an enabling way. And beyond the issue of enablement, the board sees no legal basis for imposing additional criteria, such as the presence of experimental data in the priority document, uh, which make it plausible uh, the invention uh, would work. Um, uh, and then the board's further convinced experiment change the nature of the invention disclosed. Um, a fortiori, we would suggest um, putting photographs in of the gels or a video of you carrying out the experiment uh, or something else that might uh, somehow persuade the sceptical observer 
that you had in fact done what you said you'd done, when in fact all he needs to do is follow your instructions <laughs> and find that it works. Uh, we would submit this is an area uh, where that plausibility, um, if it comes into it at all, um, certainly can't be viewed as uh, requiring uh, some um, uh, uh, some extra convincing proof uh, that you have in fact successfully carried out the very experiments uh, which you have disclosed in the document. Um, while we're in the authorities' bundle, if I may. Um, well, yes, but there's two different questions yes. there, isn't it? I mean, one is, is, is the patentee telling a lie? <laughs> um, oh. He says he's done an experiment when, in fact, he hasn't. Um, and, well, of course, you know, one starts from the proposition that applicants are telling the truth. Um, and if they say they've done an experiment, yes. unless there's some reason to disbelieve that, Precisely. then you take it at face value. Yes. Um, so, but I don't understand there to be any submission um, that um, this is that sort of case. The question is, and that's why um, Mr. I understood Mr. Michison to take the line on the professor, for example, that he did. So it doesn't matter. Um, and the reason for that is, even if you, his, his case, as I now understand it, is let's assume you take it entirely at face value question then is, well, what does that establish? Well, <laughs> if that's right, what does it establish? It establishes that you have um, uh, achieved the invention of the claims. On both sets of claims, that is <coughs> to say the product, and that is to say the use. The judge looked at what was required um, to fall within the claims so far as um, uh, the use claims were concerned uh, and confirmed that they covered just a single uh, incorporation step at least at their widest um, no more was required and that's all that would have been required for the purposes of an obviousness attack uh, and that's all that's required uh, to uh, enable the claim. So far as the product claim is concerned, of course, you simply have to uh, enable the manufacture of the product. And that's the basis of the case that I was going to take you to next, which is the 25A uh, citation in the authorities' bundle. Uh, I'm glad to took you to this, uh, so I'm not going to uh, worry you uh, too much with it. So this is the Supergem case T1616-09. Um, and um, the extra bit that I would just ask you to uh, consider um, is 6.1.2, which I'm not sure I own a friend took you to. Um, Here, the TBA say the arguments of the examining division were based on an alleged lack of evidence in the application showing that the technical problem stated in the application is synergistic improvement of the effectiveness uh, of anti-neoplastic agents and indeed being sold, especially in view of all possible anti-neoplastic agents encompassed in the claim. And then they say, since enablement uh, of claims uh, conferring absolute protection for products does not require that any specific functional effect be demonstrated, but rather that the product can be produced. Uh, this argument fails. Uh, the board agrees that claim one has very broad limits, that these are well defined, a skilled person would know without undue burden which compounds are encompassed and which were not. All that's required is to test, <coughs> and then there's the uh, particular. Um, 
So um, we do actually need to treat the product claim and the use claim separately here when one is considering the question of the neighbour. Um, um, this is, in fact, a narrow product claim. Now, the fact that one can put blinkers of different lengths on to attach the uh, fluorophore, um, which was not um, considered to be uh, of uh, technical difficulty, uh, is something um, uh, which is not relevant to uh, enable. Um, the uh, key areas here were the uh, introduction of the uh, blocking group and making available uh, a method of unblocking the blocking group, all of which are disclosed uh, and explained to work uh, in the priority document. That product, that is to say, the modified nucleotide with the azidomethyl, which the judge has held not to be obvious uh, in the light of Zavgorodny, is plainly enabled on any view. Uh, it's hard to see what more the skilled person could have done to enable it uh, than uh, 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 teach it as he does uh, in the priority document. Uh, Lords, with that, I was going to turn uh, to uh, the priority document itself uh, and then subsequently to the judgment on the priority issue. <coughs> Priority document supplemental bundle tab four. Uh, and um, as is clear when one reads the whole of this document, um, the Azido methyl is out as uh, a recommended example, uh, and then uh, it is uh, disclosed uh, specifically uh, in example one, which is on uh, page uh, 113. Uh, and the disclosure here is, we would submit, specific and encouraging. Um, three prime OH protected with an azidomethyl group is a protected form of a hemiaminol uh, is then given. So they, they identify the azidomethyl group uh, as protecting the three prime uh, OH position. Uh, nucleotides bearing this blocking group at the three prime position have been shown to be successfully incorporated by a number of different polymerases, block efficiently, and may be subsequently removed under neutral aqueous conditions using more soluble phosphines or thiols, allowing further extension. So here we have the teaching of the, the uh, nucleotide itself modified the incorporation, the success of the incorporation, the use of a number of different polymerases, and the specific ones are uh, identified uh, earlier on, um, uh, including um, uh, several that are uh, not suggested not to work, uh, block efficiently and may be subsequently removed. So they're te teaching the efficient blocking, they're teaching the subsequent removal under aqueous neutral conditions uh, using those phosphines and they're teaching further extension. And then the um, diagram confirms importantly under the uh, diagram on the left stable incorporated by enzymes efficient blocking observed and then we have the um, deprotection step 
with the water soluble phosphines um, specifically identified uh, over a specific period, 15 minutes, at a specific temperature, um, proceeding to 100% yield, um, uh, leading to that double deprotection step. Uh, so first of all, the NH2 reaction, the intermediate, which spontaneously degrades the product, um, which is the OH. And there you are, D block 3 prime OH, ready for next incorporation. Uh, and that is the chemistry of uh, a cycle uh, of um, uh, blocking, uh, unblocking, and the introduction of a new nucleotide uh, to the growing chain. Um, I wanted to show you um, what the judge said about that um, next. Starts at 134 of the bundle at page uh, 238. Oops. Well, I think we can probably, maybe we should probably start above that um, with a reference to ice world at 235. And the judge identifies the right test as being is there in the negative disclosure. Um, then makes the point argued by MGI the gels are not in the second priority document and no data which purports to be the results of an actual experiment and then notes that that's the apparent squeeze argument on them globally. He then finds that there's textual support for all the relevant claims so the idea of carrying out sequences by synthesis using those nucleotides as reversible chain terminology Closed. Leader metal not simply an entry in a list. Example one relates expressly to it. Then in 238, notes MGI's contention again that it doesn't contain any data, but points out that that isn't the whole story, even on its own terms, because of the reference to. To be sure, but can I ask you yeah. about what he says at 238? Yes. Sure, yeah. MGI contends the second priority doc contains no data to support the claimed utility. The judge doesn't say that's legally irrelevant, does he? What he goes on to say is it's factually unfounded. Right. He doesn't say that if the assertion were factually well founded, that would be illegally irrelevant. He doesn't. And implicitly, he's accepting that it is legally a legally relevant submission. Well, geez. <laughs> Whereas um, your case is, your is case actually, is that even if the facts yeah. were as asserted, it wouldn't matter. That is part of our case. I mean, our, <laughs> we have multiple layers of case. Yes, yeah. but that's your Plain first. Thing. That's your first line. Your first submission. Even is, if even if it yes, were true, yes, factually, yes. that would be legally irrelevant. But I think we've already been around the houses on the on the question of respondent status, and in my submission that doesn't in any way detract from the point that I made before, uh, which uh, is that um, <laughs> the judge is not here making a contrary finding to my case. Um, he is, in fact, um, dealing with a submission made by MGI, which he then notes um, isn't actually correct. And then ultimately reject. So there's, a, there's no contrary finding to my case anywhere in this judgment uh, that I need to um, appeal or put in a respondent's notice in my submission. I think we've been around. Yes. Uh, if I may. So is, is it your submission that <coughs> the judge really doesn't um, express a view on the legal necessity or otherwise of plausibility? Yes. I mean, it, to be fair to him, it, it wasn't. We didn't have the argument, as ever, on an 
appeal, things get focused on <laughs> points that one never thought were even right. Uh, and here we are arguing about it. I mean, my submission, uh, it's all been very clear in the skeleton arguments, and frankly, arguing about whether something should be in a respondent's notice at this stage, when it's a pure point of law, and when the judge hasn't actually made a finding against me, uh, is um, a little... Well, that's what I was getting at, because when you say a finding, I mean... When you're talking about the law, it's not necessarily the, the, the right no. way. I mean, he's made a, you say he's made a factual finding in your favour and hasn't yeah. expressed a view yeah. about the applicable law. Yes. And I would submit, your lordships, <coughs> with some respect to your lordships, the, um, uh, the, the Court of Appeal is the place to find out what the law is. Uh, <laughs> Subject, uh, of course, to the Supreme Court, Court. yes. Not <laughs> to proceed on the basis that we're just not going to discuss... Uh, what appears to be an important point of law because it wasn't raised in the respondent's notice. I mean, there may be cases, I agree, where that, that could be the right approach. But here, in my submission, it isn't. Um, yes, but you will appreciate, I hope, that what I'm interested in is not just the procedural question in this court, no. but the light it sheds on the judge's thinking. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, let's, let's assume you didn't have to serve a respondent's notice. Mm -hmm. Even so, the judge appears to be proceeding on the basis that, or, and you may say it's simply an assumption, um, that the law is as contended for by the appellants. And, and his conclusion is, on that assumption, yeah, I, it's, the facts don't support it. I think I would put it as, I don't suppose he thought of it like this, but it's, it's a provisional assumption. I will proceed on a provisional assumption, having dismissed it, I don't need to decide, in fact, whether it's right in law or not. Now, of course, I mean, we didn't, the, the point was not argued in this way, um, and, and therefore it, it's perhaps not surprising to see. No, but speaking for myself, I can see, I can see that as a, if I can use the word, plausible analysis of this section of the judgment, that, that he was silently assuming that this was a tenable argument, yes. but not resolving it because it didn't arise given its findings on the facts. Yes, he didn't need to decide it. I think that's how I'd put it, and I probably can say a little more about it. Um, the bit I was going to um, get to, which in my submission has some importance, uh, is what he says at 239 under the... Um, <coughs> The reproduction of the diagram. Uh, he says this assertion um, does not have any graphs or gels associated with it. And he's talking there about the entirety of the uh, paragraph he quotes at 238 in the diagram. But it is a statement that experiments have been done and that they were successful in very specific ways which are relevant to success from the point of view of the skilled person. So yeah, the patentee is saying that he's done this. And as my old Lord Justice Arnold said earlier, and I would, uh, would, would respect uh, adopt that, um, the starting point must surely be the reader of a specification um, will uh, assume that if the patentee says he's done something, and he got to certain results, then at least, prima facie, that's what happened. And the, it, it's, well, and a friend made a point, and to some extent a fair point, that it's not, it's not for me to say, oh, well, look, this is, a, this is a pattern written by a particular company or individual, and you give that even more credence. Um, but, it, I mean, it may be right to say that if you've read the rest of the document, and it was total nonsense from beginning to end, then maybe you might be more sceptical. But that's not suggested here. And that's really the only point I was trying to make in perhaps a slightly clumsy passage in, in our skeleton arguments. Well, but here you can go further, as we've already discussed. One, it was never suggested by Professor Marx that this was um, prophetic, to use the more neutral term. Secondly, he didn't say that it wasn't plausible. No. I was just looking at this. You'll tell me if this is a, an 
nonsense point, but I was looking at the examples in the priority document, and I can't find the same kind of language used in the other two examples as we were looking at. No. Um, so there is that sort of contextual point. Well, Lord, yes. I, I, I would adopt that. You may not want myself. that. You may not want that point. No, no. It, it, it's a fair point. The, the, the patentee talks about the examples that he's carried out in different terms. And indeed, in one respect, he says, he notes that one example worked better than another. Um, I think in terms of the speed of incorporation in varying examples two and three. But it's, it's not a case that, on the face of it, looks like someone just making everything up. And um, it's not surprising, we would submit, therefore, that it wasn't actually challenged on that basis in the evidence. Um, so we have here a uh, finding of fact by the judge, but it's a statement that the experiments have been done and that they were successful in ways that are relevant to success from the point of view of a skilled person, matter that was not the subject of challenge. And it would have been something which, in my submission, uh, one would expect um, if a positive point was going to be made on it, uh, that the defendant, the appellant, uh, would have, should have challenged. Uh, and it's only then that he turns to uh, Professor Ledley's evidence, having effectively construed the document himself. And then he founds Professor Ledley saying, the same thing, essentially, clearly disclosing, and by contrast with Edgar Rodney, because of course he's speaking again in the context of this squeeze argument, I think, the utility uh, of these nucleotides as reversible chain terminators in a sequencing mechanism. Uh, and then he, he gives uh, a summary of the example uh, that the document discloses. And it's said by my learned friend, well, he's just parroting the, the text. But, of course, against the background of what the judges found, that this is a statement that experiments have been done and that they were successful. Uh, one reads Professor Ledley's uh, evidence uh, in that light. It is a disclosure that they have been shown to be successfully incorporated and made sub subsequently be removed with 100% yield. And the only challenge in the evidence to any of that was um, Professor Marx saying you might be a bit sceptical about the 100%. And in fact, that was put to Professor Ledley, who said, well, actually, I think we've given the references in our skeleton. Um, Green and Watts says 100%, quite a lot of its uh, uh, reactions. It's not extraordinary. It's a reaction that went to completion in his view. And if we're. Uh, no one was suggesting that it mattered whether it was 99% or 100%. Uh, that this was uh, not a point that uh, appeared to go anywhere at all. But then. So 100% might just be rounded up. <laughs> might be rounded up. I mean, just a. Yes, a, a, an easy way of saying it went to completion. Um, and um, all that happened was that in oral closing, um, a learned friend uh, said at one point uh, that um, uh, perhaps what's being disclosed here is somewhat theoretical. But that's not something that his expert had said. And one surmises that that's why uh, the judge turns to uh, the question of scepticism in paragraph 241. But before we get there, we need to look at 240. Um, because the judge is then drawing his conclusions about priority uh, from the findings that he's just made, including the experiments have been done and said to be done and said to have been successful. Uh, and he says, the same invention is disclosed. Uh, the disclosure supports the claims and is an enabling disclosure. It also provides plausible information which supports the idea that a sequence synthesis scheme 
uh, will work. Now, plausible because the patentee has done it. Uh, suppose she. Um, and if you take that prima facie at face value, and there's no reason why you shouldn't, then the judge is plainly right. Uh, and in our submission, that should be the end of the priority point. And indeed, the judge could and should perhaps have stopped there, uh, given the nature of the evidence. Um, but rather than simply dismiss my learned friend's uh, submission about theoretical disclosure that he made in passing and closing, uh, he turns and makes the statements that he does in 241. Uh, and uh, we've dealt with this uh, in our skeleton, but um, it is, it's not really a finding at all. It's more we would submit um, a kind of musing. A passing comment. <laughs> a passing comment. Uh, uh, it's quite yeah. hard to define it because one doesn't often see things like this in judgment, but one might have a degree of scepticism. I mean, the word one is interesting here because it doesn't actually identify who it is that's got the scepticism. Um, uh, might, obviously, is, is entirely conditional. Um, uh, and the degree is um, how long is a piece of string, uh, as indeed perhaps is scepticism, which may extend from a niggling doubt to. Uh, uh, a refusal to believe that something could possibly be true. <laughs> um, uh, from the way example one is written, the, uh, it's unclear what he means by that. Um, the assertion of 100% yield, that goes back to Professor Marx's evidence, uh, and the absence of gels. Uh, and <laughs> we would suggest um, the absence of gels perhaps only becomes relevant once you've seen uh, the application in which the gels are actually shown. So one has to be a little bit careful uh, when considering how you would read the priority document on its own. But there you are. Um, whether such a test really had been carried out, or whether this was a so-called prophetic example. Um, again, it doesn't make a lot of sense because he starts with a degree of scepticism and then posits two diametrically opposed alternatives. <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, again, uh, it's a little unclear where he's going. But it's certainly not a finding on any view, as my own friend characterizes it on at least one occasion in his skeleton argument, that this is a prophetic example only. And he appears to be just musing about possibility uh, of someone having a degree of scepticism about it, because he then says, but on the facts of this case, I find that doesn't matter. It doesn't render what he's described any less plausible. And it's a, it's a difficult passage to get to grips with. We would submit what he's really saying, if he's saying anything um, uh, particularly clear here, uh, is that the, the points that he's mentioned, the 100% point, the absence of gels, really are pretty minor. I mean, they don't, they're, they're, not, they're not a very convincing way of denting uh, what the patentee has actually said and what appears to be a proper um, uh, experiment which has been carried out and was successful. Um, we would submit the best way to read this, and it's not free from doubt, but the best way to read it uh, is that the judge is saying the niggling issues which have been raised by Mr. Mitchison uh, and to some extent by Professor Mark um, don't actually dent uh, the uh, confidence uh, uh, of the skill person that the patentee has really done this, uh, and that therefore it's perfectly plausible. Because I, we would agree, the statement, uh, it doesn't render what is described any less plausible, if taken literally, 
is quite hard to understand. I mean, it would appear to be flat contrary uh, to common sense to say, <laughs> uh, well, uh, if I actually believed that this patentee had made the whole thing up, they wouldn't render it less plausible. It would be a strange conclusion. Yeah. It would plainly render it a little less plausible, at least. Um, is he saying, that's all he means. Is, he, is, is the substance of what he's saying, or what you are saying, he said, yeah. or intended, um, that he's taken account of these factors in the process of reaching his conclusion uh, or his finding of fact in 239? Well, look, yes. Essentially, it's another yes. Way of looking at yes. It. These small points don't dent my overall decision. Um, Fanti's saying he did it. Nobody's put forward any coherent <coughs> evidence that um, which would dent that, uh, and therefore it's perfectly plausible. Uh, and we can under we can understand why my learned friend has seized on this paragraph to say, well, look, it just undermines the whole idea that this judge knew what he was doing when he was considering plausibility. But this is an experienced patents judge who has given judgments which my learned friend himself is relying on the subject of plausibility. Uh, it's certainly an area he's extremely familiar with, uh, as indeed um, uh, uh, is, is the whole assessment of um, uh, chemistry and experimental data of this kind. Um, uh, <laughs> a literal reading of 241 is, in my submission, not something which it's reasonable. I wondered if you were saying something else, which is, let me assume it is just prophetic, and suppose it had been written as a prophetic example. Yes. It would still be, it would still meet the relatively low threshold of plausibility. He could equally be saying that, rather than, and that the words any less plausible yeah. essentially meant not, it doesn't render it implausible. No, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make it so implausible as to fall below the standard of plausibility which the authorities require. Well, yes, I think we've been struggling to reach that kind of... <laughs> well, that's a slightly <laughs> different analysis of I what he's saying. Is. Yes, I think it is. But it, though it reaches a similar conclusion. Um, but yes, it's a slightly different analysis. Do we need to grapple with what the threshold of plausibility might be? Um, in my submission, not. Um, it, we don't dispute the analysis of Lord Sumption Although, um, having looked at this for another purpose recently, if one, look, if one parses the judgments of Lord Sumption and Lord Justice Floyd below in that case, uh, it's actually quite difficult to find much distinction between them. Well, it's um, clearly not as low as Lord Justice Floyd. It's well, not, it's not very we would say Lord Justice Floyd had been um, taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> Misunderstood. It's, it's a, it's well, a, yeah, but that can't be right because they reached a, opposite conclusions when applying the test to the facts. Yes. Well, <laughs> I mean, I pr and I appreciate that it's not inconceivable that two yeah. courts applying the same test to the same it's facts not. could reach opposite conclusions. But it does suggest that there's a real difference. I agree. There's a difference. Uh, I think we would. It doesn't really matter because we, we're we're very happy to accept what Lord Sumption said for today's purposes. Yeah. Um, it's just one reads some parts of Lord Sumption's judgment where he's characterising what Lord Justice Floyd said, which sound incredible when one reads them. Uh, and in my submission, that wasn't actually what <laughs> Justice Floyd was saying. Um, there needs to be some credible scientific basis um, uh, for believing uh, an assertion that's made um, that one has to assess from the point of view of Lord Justice Floyd. We would say that's essentially the test. Yeah, um, and Lord Justice Floyd uses quite similar language at one point, uh, although reaches a different result. But there you are. Um, well, Lord's, uh, I see it's twenty past four. Um, I have um, a little more to say on uh, obviousness um, to try and draw the um, uh, strands together. Uh, and um, I thought you'd done obviousness. I must say. Well, I there have. We go. I, 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 <laughs> If I may, it might be useful for me at least to um, try and draw the strands together, having uh, considered.
considered um, what's been submitted today in uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, that, uh, that yes, of course, I'm sure that wouldn't be a problem. Um, and Mr. Richardson, any idea how long you might be in reply? Uh, certainly no more than half an hour. Right, so that should give the other teams sufficient time to finish tomorrow, do you think? Possibly. I'm I mean, I'm not putting any pressure on you, obviously, or more to the point on the other teams. Um, I think the other teams are likely to be quite short. I think that's, that's what I've been hearing. Okay, sounds good. We'll, we'll, we'll try and find so out overnight. I'll update you in the morning. Fine. Good, we'll resume at 10.30 in the morning.